Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my first time to uh, La Palmas, but I really like it. Uh, I'm going to talk about smart tourism and smart services, and I'm going to try to demystify what we mean by smart or what um, we would like to call smart. And by doing that, I would like to inspire you in terms of what we can develop, but also to problematize you in terms of what is the type of the world that we're going to live in. So um, I'm trying to keep it a little bit of abstract rather than focusing on specific technologies or applications as well. Everything is becoming smart now, isn't it? Smartphones, smart houses, smart cars, smart uh, fridges, smart wives, I don't know, whatever. Uh, what does it come in your mind when you think about smart? Sensors. Sensors. Well, yeah. You're one of the many people that whenever they think about smart, they think about technologies, isn't it? And there are so many technologies. Sensors, industrial web, Internet of the Things, linked data, big data, artificial intelligence, virtual intelligence, cloud computing, and I can go on and on and on. But what does this mean? That whenever we have a new technology, the existing one becomes stupid? That's not a really good definition, isn't it? I'm an academic. I really like definitions, by the way. Anyway. Um, Let's try to demystify this by giving you an example. Technologies allow us to communicate. It allows us to become smarter, isn't it, and become more social. So think about the intelligent, social, interconnected, social bike. Many destinations now, wherever you go, you have bikes to share and go around, don't you? But let's take the example that this bicycle, it's smart. Yeah? So it has sensors. It can understand the surface, so it can adjust the gears. It has sensors to understand the weather conditions. It has sensors to understand that I am smart Mariana, approaching it. So I connect with the bike. It downloads all my profile and data, who I am, how much I weight, if I like vegetarian restaurants, or if I like to go to museums, or if I want to pre uh, and I prefer to go swimming. And as soon as I'm on the bike, it adjusts everything. It gives me a personalized itinerary where to go. It has sensors and big data to know the traffic conditions, so it can suggest me alternative routes. And it can also connect with my friends. So if I'm approaching the museum, it can alert my friends to come and welcome me to go to the museum and have a shared experience. And if suddenly, the weather changes and the sun is shining, it can say to me, well, it's time to go for a swim. Or there is a happy hour in this bar, go there. Cool? <laughs> Smart agents interconnected with each other. How far do you think we are from this scenario? Not that far. If you want to build these smart agents, basically you need three components. You need the physical component, the bicycle, the smart museum, isn't it? Then on top of that, you need to build the data, collect the data, analyze them, take decisions. And you need the third component. You need the connectivity to connect all these different actors together to collaborate, share, and take synchronized action in some way. And we are not very far um, in terms of how smart we are becoming. But the levels of smartness that you can build are different. The lowest level of smartness you can have is to have a smart agent who is able to monitor its internal and external environment. So the bicycle, knowing that the tire is flat, give an automatic alert to the maintenance station for somebody to come and maintain and uh, fix the error, isn't it? An external sensor to know the weather conditions to adjust different itineraries to the, to the rider. The smart agent should be able to control and take decisions, its own or other actors. 
to take optimal decisions, optimize the route, optimize the suggestions, optimize the um, uh, personal profiles, isn't it, or the uh, experience of the bike to the rider. And also be autonomous. Take decisions without any agent. A bicycle reproducing another bicycle, well, maybe that's not the case, but we have machine-to-machine -machine communication, isn't it? Taking decisions, automatic ones. We have robots and algorithms, developing other robots and algorithms. So the highest level of autonomy, it's here, maybe not commercialized, maybe we see it in military, but it definitely does exist. So there are different levels of smartness. Uh, and this is a better way to define what is smart. What we also need to have into, in our mind is that smartness doesn't relate to any specific technology, either if this is hardware, software, infoware, or even humanware, or robotware, whatever you might call it. It's about everything and about how all these things, they're synchronized and they are interconnected to try to take proactive but also predictive and smart decisions as well. We are not very far from this scenario, and I said this quite a few times already. I don't know how many of you have heard or have seen Mercedes Me, which is the smart car developed by Mercedes. It has many sensors. It can be driven by itself. It can give automatic decisions to the maintenance station if there is any problem or to do predictive maintenance. It can give suggestions to the driver where to go, make automatic um, uh, reservations for restaurants, alerts to home, whatever you might name it. Few months ago, however, there was uh, a dispute. There was a question because a journalist has also actually revealed in a press release that this software of the smart car is designed to take a decision to kill pedestrians instead of the car driver in case something is going to happen. How do you think the public reacted to that? Well, the CEO was almost kicked out of his job. Um, a researcher tried to investigate more about people's and civilians' reactions to this kind of smart cars. And he did a study, and he published his findings in a very high top quality scientific journal. And he asked a basic question to the people. What is your opinion about smart cars taking decisions about whose life is more valuable? People came back and they said, well, you know what? Cars should be able to choose to save as many lives as possible, and of course not the driver. But then there was a second question, and people were asked, would you buy a car that will kill you as a driver? And everybody said, of course not. This is the usual perceptual behavioral gap, isn't it? Everybody's saying, well, I'm a, an environmental concerned consumer, and then you ask him, will you pay 10 euros more to stay in an environmental hotel? And they say, no. Well, that's human beings. What, however, this tells to us is that, of course, this poor CEO that almost lost his job, he took the correct decision for Mercedes, because he actually built a car that it was going to be commercially appealing. This is what people want to buy. Nobody will buy a car that will kill him. So this guy was back. Immediately as he's back in his chair, he created another press release saying, well, you know what? Neither the programmers or any automated system is actually programmed by Mercedes to value whose life is more or less important. And of course that was important because as you can imagine, nobody would like to buy Mercedes afterwards, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, now why did I give you this example? Now as you immediately understand, the impact of smartness, it's not only economic or sociocultural. Of course it is legal and more importantly, moral or ethics. 
Are we ready to understand what are the implications and how we are going to update our society and our legal framework or values? Uh, that's a big question mark. So I have defined in some ways what we mean by smartness and what the smart actors, either human actors or technology actors, should be able to be doing. What are the characteristics or the features of smart tourism services? And what we should be building or we should be able the system to be configured to provide? I have consolidated them into 10 different characteristics that I call them the 10 commandments. So I'll try to be quite quick. Uh, what is the first one? We always said personalization is important. Well, nowadays, we have gone one step further. We're talking about hyper-personalization that is based on two features, the anticipatory and the self-configurated nature. What do I mean by anticipatory? I'm sure everybody is using Google Maps, isn't it? We can't get lost any, anymore, that's it. We just pick up Google Maps, they tell us where we are and how to go, isn't it? Now, as you know, Google Maps monitors you on real time. It knows your walking pace on, based on history and on your current state. So it can actually predict you how long it takes to go from one place to another on real time. This is anticipatory. What you like, isn't it? Even before you, uh, you ask for it. That's another example based on the smart city in Dublin. They have interconnected all public transportation means, the metro, the tram, the buses. So you go on a website or in a mobile app and it tells you how much you have to wait or if you need to run to catch the bus. It tells you how to change tram and bus to go from one point to another. And all the historical data about who goes where or where is every bus or tram is used to take predictive analytics. Do I need an extra bus line? Do I have to extend the network? Do I have to uh, divert the bus driver because there is a traffic or a, a traffic jump? Yeah? Uh, so big data to take optimal decisions uh, and to be proactive, anticipatory of anything. They have done the same with the bike share program in New York. You go on a website again as a tourist, you see a heat map with different colors. The heat map actually tells you in real time where are available bicycles, less bicycles to find, isn't it? Uh, near to attractions, so you know where to find a bicycle and you know where are the congested areas to avoid and go to less busy areas and change your itinerary on real time again. The maintenance stations, they know if they need to transfer bicycles from one point to another, and they use the historical data again to suggest itineraries to people to divert them to off track or to different areas to avoid congestion and crowd and whatever other troubles they have. What do we mean by self-configurated experiences, smart experiences? This is when the system has the ability to do adjustments on real time based on changes. So imagine, for example, that your calendar on your mobile phone is connected with any other mobile smart application that you have. You're currently in a meeting, you're running late. The software knows that. So instead of you walking to your meeting in a restaurant, automatically the software sends an order to your Uber so a taxi will come to pick you up to go to the restaurant because you have no time to walk. And as soon as you arrive in the restaurant, your calorie burning software knows that you haven't burned the calories. So it will suggest you what you eat. Yeah? So this is self-configurated automatically. You don't take decisions. The system suggests you what you should be doing. Now, if people are not going to take decisions in the future and your artificial intelligence, your smart agent is going to take decisions, what are the changes that we have to do? From a marketeer point of view, you used to pay supermarkets to put different products in different services because the humans were deciding and they were going to shopping. When we went to shop online, then we had to pay Google 
to optimize our search results so you appear on the top. But still, humans were taking decisions. Nowadays, it's not me taking decisions, online or offline. It will be Alexa. So as a marketeer, I will have to promote my brand to Alexa. And how should I know that Alexa takes the decisions that are appropriate to me and not to the brand? And how do I know that Alexa is not hacked, sharing my private data to anyone? And who is going to accredit Alexa that it's the best and it's not something else? There are many legal, moral, ethical, marketing, whatever implications, as you can imagine. Um, rule number two, smart services, they need to become from localized, contextualized. We always emphasize the need for local-based information, and we have seen many examples, somebody arriving in the airport, receiving automatic localized messages. This is the nearest hotel. This is where you um, rent a car. This is the closest attraction. Your gate is changing, whatever you name it. But location is not enough. We need to customize the message to the person, not only based on where he is, but based on with whom he is there, how he reports that he feels, exciting, tired, miserable, with different emoticons on social media, with whom he is, with his parents, kid, husband, wife, whether it is raining, whether there is a political arrest, whether is there, there is a traffic accident, whether there is an emergency, delay, you name it. So we need to move from localized to what we call social, contextualized and mobile applications to consider whatever is happening around the person. Can we do this? Of course we can do. Big data. <laughs> Collect data from different applications and from social media profiles, put it all together and give SOCOMO applications and sophisticated decisions to users. Google Now has an application, they call it Google Now. It's possible when you use this application, when you walk through the street and the application identifies that you go through a supermarket and it knows that your smart fridge is running out of milk to give you an automatic alert to go in the supermarket and buy the milk. It's as simple as that, so Socomo application. Um, in Tasmania, an island um, south of where I am based in Australia, they have an application they call it Tourism Tracer. It's an application tourist download for free. But nothing is free as a free milk, because as soon as you download the application, the application tracks everything. Where you browse on your mobile phone, all your social media profiles, public information, where you go, how long you stay, what you buy. They do big data analysis on real time, and they have heat maps. They know on real time where the tourists are. Red zones are the overcrowded zones. Green zones, they're still not fully occupied. And they can see how people move on real time. They know who likes to go hiking in the night when it's still raining. They know who prefers to have a, co a coffee in the morning or late afternoon. So they know who to target based on nationality, gender, age, preferences, you name it. They have done the same in Amsterdam. They don't have a mobile app, they have a destination card. You buy the destination card because you combine your mobility, the ticket to different public services, with tickets to museums. And when you use it to take off prices, they know again where you go, isn't it, and what you visit. So a major conclusion that they have found is that most of the people, they prefer to go to the Van Gogh Museum in the morning and have a cruise in the canal in the afternoon. Hmm. Amsterdam is one of the over-tourism destinations, as you know. So what did they, did they decide to do? Well, try to divert traffic, send messages to people. Why don't you have a canal boat trip in the morning and go in the museum in the afternoon? <laughs> Yeah, very simple. You don't need artificial intelligence to, to think about this, but you need the data. Um, they have done something else to divert traffic. 
they have rebranded a place which is called Zandburt, which is a bit very far away, and they have called it the beach of Amsterdam. They have included the price to go there in the destination card, and now more people, they're being diverted off the traffic. They have an application, they call it Discover the City. On real time, they show to people the queues outside of attractions, so they know to try to avoid them. And they have an artificial intelligence software that it will scrap all your data on social media, particularly Facebook, that it can understand what you like, vegetarian, what type of music, how you feel, to send you personalized, contextualized messages, what to do at the destination. Um, feature number three, experiences of people at destinations, they have to be seamless. Traditionally, we used to think about an experience like a journey. journey. What do you do before, during, and after your experience? Do people think like this, you think? No. Tourists do not think anymore, chronologically. And they don't do things as they used to. I'm sure you have seen people that they go to destinations and they haven't even booked accommodation. They do everything ad hoc. I'm sure that the first thing that you do when you go to a restaurant is probably take a picture of your dish and put it on Instagram and say how beautiful it is and how delicious it is. Well, taste the food first and then write the comment. People don't wait to go back home to write a review. They write the review on real time even before experiencing what it is. People do not think about before, during, after. They want everything seamless and on real time. So there are many applications that they enable people to have this seamless experience. Internet of the Things, uh, we have heard many things before. This is the example of Starwood, that they have the iPhone watch, isn't it, to use it to make bookings, reservations, to open your door key, to control everything in the room, air conditioning. Uh, voice over IP, telephones, reservations, check-in, check-outs, you name it. Uh, take photographs and write reviews while you're in the hotel or after you leave. Um, theme parks, they are doing the same. Uh, smart applications that you can use for bookings when you're there to do uh, bookings for restaurants. Take pictures and upload them instantly on your profile. Write the reviews, you name it again. Um, from a destination point of view, there are many smart applications that I have usually classified them into three major clusters. The one that destinations can use to enhance the experience of the people, for example, virtual reality or augmented reality, uh, translations of signs, applications that you can use so people can reach the destination or they can move within the destination, sharing a bike, sharing a car, isn't it? Uh, making an air transportation or applications that you can use for people to make bookings, make payments, uh, develop their personalized itineraries, uh, share reviews, and again, whatever refers to, uh, to the experience itself. Another important feature, and I have to ask about time because I, I have to finalize it. Experiences and smart experiences, even if they're technology-based, they are also becoming more human or more anthropomorphic, I would say. And there are many examples. Uh, think about anthropomorphic robots being concierge, being waiters, chat boxes on websites, virtual artificial assistants like Amazon Alexa, the Siri, Samsung, Google Assistants, you name it. Uh, and there are many examples, again. Uh, probably you have heard about Sophia the robot or replica the chat box that people nowadays they use it as a friend. You can download the application and you can train the application to recognize your face so it can understand whether you're crying, whether you're happy and respond to you emotionally as well. Of course the software can understand feelings and replicate them. It doesn't know what it means though. Yeah? But anyway, it's a good friend. It's a good a company and it's a good um, uh, uh, anthropomorphic service robot that you can have. Sophia the robot, um, it has a passport. 
Saudi Arabia recognized it as a human being. And now it is fighting against women's rights. That's um, uh, irony, isn't it, in Saudi Arabia? Anyway, uh, Sophia the robot acts like a human being. It has a social media profile on Facebook and Twitter. It replies to you like a human being. It goes to conferences and it talks like a human being. Um, it has a job, a permanent job for life. So it's a marketeer, very sophisticated one. And as you can imagine, there are many protests against humanoid or anthropomorphic robots. In Saudi Arabia, this robot has a passport, it's considered as a human being, it has the same rights. In Europe, scientists representing many disciplines, medicine, robotics, artificial intelligence, management, ethics, they're trying to persuade the EU not to give a human right to, to robots like this, uh, for the obvious reasons. Uh, you can join them, you can debate them, you can do whatever you want. So the dilemmas are a lot. Uh, and you can think about how sex destinations or sex robots, they can replace destinations or even workers. Uh, but anyway, drone delivery. Uh, there are many fast food uh, operators that they have implemented them, Uber Eats, KFC, Pizza Hut. Uh, they have even updated their legislation. They have specific guidelines how to design a drone because if a drone kills somebody, creates an accident, it creates a food poisoning, of course, somebody has to take responsibility about this. So, uh, the legalities have been updated here. And probably it's time to stop here. But uh, happy to share my other five commandments later on in questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>